Today we will continue the theme of subjectivation and truth, part two. I am Rodrigo Gim, an anthropologist and social critic, and this is Critique with Nietzsche and Foucault. What do you mean by the moral subject? Please comment below the video so I can enter into a conversation with you. If you believe thinking is fundamental in your life and you think you can discuss thought, subscribe to this channel because that is our task here. Michel Foucault's study of the practices of self in ancient Greece led him to create a genealogy of subjectivation, of the processes of constructing subjects. In the volumes of the history of sexuality, Foucault showed how ancient Greek culture had, as one of its central practices of the self, the so-called care of the self, where an aesthetic of existence was practiced, where there were no fixed norms for subjects. They were free to take care of themselves, but they had to observe signs, and these signs were not housed in an interiority of the subjects, but in the relationships these subjects had and cultivated with food and their excesses, with the climate, with nature, and other subjects. The care of the self is the production of subjectivities, of subjectivation without norms, without a code of conduct. Foucault showed how this practice of self changed considerably once the dominance of caring for yourself became know thyself. This change in the period of, the, of Imperial Rome shifted the axis of practices of the self to the domain of universal and rational rules of behavior. Following this legacy of knowing thyself, the West will be characterized by the dominance of subjectivation of the self as a self that has an essence. And this essence, it is possible to know it rationally. And this practice of knowing oneself rationally, knowing the essence of the self through a rationality that is an accumulation of fixed truths about oneself is what came to dominate, dominate the characteristic subjectivation of the West. This way of knowing oneself had already been indicated by Plato, for whom philosophy helps a being to make an anamnesis, a self-remembering, recollection, uh, one of the practices that Foucault calls the techniques of the self. And it consisted in creating a fixed description, an eternal description of the essence of being. For Plato, it is possible to have a final and timeless explanation of being. Uh, that is very different from Socrates, who walked the streets asking people these questions. Do you take care of yourself? Or when he asked the free man, do you take care of yourself so that you can take care of the city. In Socrates, there was critical reason, but it did not have the world as fully knowable. For Socrates, the free man, in order to govern the city, had to first govern themselves and be in constant search and experimentation with themselves to be truly free, only then to be able to act for the freedom in the city. For Foucault, care of the self is a forgotten tradition of the West. The dominance of know thyself came about because this tradition was reinforced and enhanced by the hermeneutics of the subject brought about by Christianity. Christianity has produced subjects who ask themselves this question. How can I look within to my interiority, to my consciousness, to really know myself? How can I see in me the clashes between good and evil so that I may cleanse myself from evil? How can I follow what pastors and other authorities tell me that is better for myself? Thus, the dominant subjectivation today still follows what Foucault called 
pastoral power. That is, for the subject to know himself, he now needs an authority, such as a pastor, a guru, etc., to tell him his truth. The subject no longer experiences, is no longer aware of signs in himself or signs of nature, does not test truths in relations with others. The dominant subject waits for someone to tell him his truth. Some authority tells you who you are and what you can or cannot do with your life. This is the culture of herd morality, as Nietzsche says, the culture of sameness uh, and marked, labeled, codified and normalized lives. Self-knowledge in the dominant culture today happens through the pursuit of fixed and rigid truths about oneself that are produced in the market, in the media, in the dominant institutions. The subjects of the herd look to these sources for the latest uh, innovations that can make them more themselves. To be yourself today, you need to be up to date with the latest truths and latest techniques and technologies. Relations with the outside, with social and other technologies still define the relationship of the subject with the truth, but it does so in a normalized way where the truth of the self is no longer an experimentation or a relation, but is dictated by authorities actually from the outside in. The subject's only task is to align himself with truths that are circulating in the market and in social institutions. The subject is more himself when he is more individualized within normalizing patterns. To be an individual, you must be the same as other individuals. You must be part of the herd. If you are not part of the herd, who live very much the same ways of, life, of living, think much the same, want the same, speak the same, you are not recognized as an individual. Dominant practices of the self today don't recognize group identities, ethnicities, or other nationalities that do not fit the normalized individual subject, the subject of the herd. To be subject in the dominant society, it is necessary not to have ties with communities, with nations, with differentiated ethnicities, which do not individualize their subjects. Subjects who do not submit to authorities, subjects who refuse to live up to the dominant individualizing standards, are called vagabonds and the like. Because the normalized subject works and doesn't ask what to work for, who he works for, why he works, and what are the effects of his work on his life and on the lives of others and nature. The normalized subject resents those who question labor relations and all other social, economic, and cultural relations because for the normalized subject, everything is given, nothing can be changed. The normalized subject has the experience of himself as a sameness, is tired of himself and life, and blames others for moving, for leaving life open and mobile, because the normalized does not want to remember that he has choices and that the structure that determine choice, choices can also move. The normalized subject is afraid of time. He cannot stop time and resents and chooses enemies that remind him at all times that life can be other. Normalized subjects hate indigenous people because they remind them that life can be radically different. And what normalization cannot process is difference and time, the lord of change. The normalized subject wants to obey and authorities tell him what to think, what to say, what to feel, what to do. And the subject calls it freedom. I call it a lowered, diminished life. The normalized subject only sees problems in relations with others. He believes that his freedom is only following his own inner truths. And so when he follows truths established for him, by the market, by gurus and by authorities, he calls it liberation. But this is precisely 
his servitude, his willingness to obey orders, to just follow fixed truths for him, shows how he is a slave, a slave to what others say is his truth. We will continue this exploration in our next video, Subjectivation and Truth, part three. Until then, people.